A PC Magazine survey in February of 1983 found that 96.3% of IBM PCs were ordered with PC-DOS, compared to 34 with CPM86, or the multitasking concurrent CPM86. Through this time, digital research still remained influential, with US $45 million in 1983 sales making digital research the fourth largest microcomputer software company. However, times were changing rapidly. By 1984, digital research admitted that they had lost the first generation PC software market, but hoped to succeed with the upcoming Intel 80286 CPU and the Motorola 68000. And in 1984, the company formed a partnership with AT&T to develop software for Unix System 5 and sell its own and third party products in retail stores. Jerry Purnell, a writer in Popular Computing, warned later that year that many people of stature seem to have left or are leaving digital research and that DRI better get its act together. Gary was interviewed around this time and whilst he gave a fantastic insight into the computing landscape that he could see unfolding before him, he admitted that he was not a businessman and that he only went into business to support his computer habits with the proceeds. It just uh, was a very natural thing to write and it turns out other people had a need for an operating system like that and so uh, it was a very natural thing. I wrote it for my own use. So I knew Gary back when he was an assistant professor at Monterey Post Grad School and I was simply a grad student. Uh, and, and went down, sat in his hot tub, uh, smoked dope with him, and uh, thoroughly enjoyed it all, uh, and commiserated and talked nerd stuff. He liked playing with gadgets, just like Waz did and does, just like I did and do. He wasn't really interested in, in, in how you drive the business. He, he worked on projects, things that interest him. He didn't go rushing off to the patent office and patent CPM and patent every line of code he could. He didn't try to just squeeze the last dollar out of it. Gary was not a, uh, a fighter. Gary avoided conflict. Gary hated conflict. Bill, I don't think anyone could say, backed away from conflict. Though these were tumultuous times, Gary had stuck by his company operating model, where he worked on the technical products, leaving Dorothy to head the management. In 1983, digital research was under pressure like never before, and life for Gary and Dorothy both felt the same pressure in their personal lives. Their marriage was on the rocks. Within a further two years, the sales figures showed that DRI had massively lost their claim over the ecosystem. It was an ecosystem that would have perhaps not grown up at all, or would have looked a lot differently had it not been for the help and inspiration of Kildall. Many different computer manufacturers are making the CPM operating system standard on most models. Digital Research Incorporated had been taken out in this anti-competitive battle by IBM and Microsoft, waging the IBM PC and MS-DOS as the weapons of their war. Gary and Dorothy filed for divorce and agreed to bring in a more experienced management team to look after digital research. Gary resigned as CEO in June, and despite regular attempts to publicize CPM, the IBM PC version of CPM86 was shelved in 1986. Gary stayed on at Digital Research as chairman of the board, and continued to work on other products, including the graphical windowing desktop, which became known as GEM. GEM became available on the PC before the release of Microsoft Windows, and it looked and operated better even when Windows did arrive. GEM was the official graphical desktop operating system on the Atari ST computer too, known as TOS. Other digital research staff worked on a multitude of great products, many of which ended up in some form or another on the PC, including MPM86. MPM allowed multiple users to use dumb terminals and connect to just one PC. This made for significant cost savings in a workplace, especially where staff depended upon sharing data amongst each other. This was something that Microsoft never really managed to do until Windows for Workgroups 3.11 in 1992. However, limited attempts were made with the ill-fated MS-DOS 4 and via network shims in DOS 5 and upwards. Later still, DRI produced concurrent DOS and multi-user DOS, which allowed for modern PC networking, generally as we know it today. 
all of this was years ahead of Microsoft and even Apple's work in these areas at the time. One of the new digital research management's ideas was to make a version of DOS for the PC that was better than MS-DOS in most ways, but be 100% compatible with MS-DOS. The product was called DR-DOS, although when it came to magazine reviews, the reviewers often called it Dr. DOS, as it fixed many of the issues with MS-DOS. The irony of cloning an operating system that started out as a clone of his own was probably not lost on Gary. Although DR-DOS was better than MS-DOS, Microsoft continued to use backhanded methods to stifle the adoption of DR-DOS, including a very sneaky and deliberate measure in the beta version of Windows 3.1, which upon detection of DR-DOS would refuse to operate. This example of Microsoft's anti-competitive nature infamously became known as the R-Code bug. And although it was removed from the final public release of Windows 3.1, it stifled beta testing of 3.1 for would-be DR-DOS developers, meaning it made it harder to test that their software would work under digital Research's platform. Although not related to digital research, over the following decades, Microsoft would go on to be sued by the United States government for anti-competitive or monopolistic trading actions and eventually found guilty in the year 2000. It is perhaps fair to say that anti-competitive behavior was always in Microsoft's DNA. When Bill Gates headed Microsoft, he was not a man that liked to lose at anything, not at operating systems and not at internet browsers alike. Bill wanted to win, incredible desire to win and to beat other people. At Microsoft, we, the whole idea was that we would put people under, you know, and unfortunately, uh, that's happened a lot. <laughs> It was around this time that Bill Gates approached Gary with a commercial offer. Bill had spoken with Steve Ballmer, now Bill's 2IC at Microsoft, admitting that DR-DOS was a threat to MS-DOS. Microsoft had lots of money and asked Kildall if he would be willing to sell DRI. Kildall asked for a modest $26 million, Gates counted with $10 million, and Gary walked away. Gary's interest in digital research through these times started to wane. He was getting tired of the constant politics and even more tired of being repeatedly asked whether he chose to go flying the day that IBM came knocking. Bill Gates' version of the story seemed to become the common version of events. And over the years, this constant reminder of a singular moment in time really started to wear Gary down. So it was unsurprising that Gary started to set his sights on other things. He started a company called ActiVenture. He was very proud of this. This was the first product of his new interactive company, then called ActiVenture. In 1985, Gary showed the very first encyclopedia on a CD-ROM, a project that grew out of his fascination with early video discs. The Grolier Academic American Encyclopedia had many features that are commonplace today including hypertext links, a full text search engine, and a traditional bookshelf interface. Now that's all in the CD-ROM that's in this player right here. And, and what, what's the amount of storage involved? How much? Uh, what's well, this capacity? is 550 megabytes, uh, uh, half a billion bytes of information, enough to stretch uh, 10 characters per inch from uh, here to Denver. <laughs> <laughs> This was all in a time where multimedia, including CD-ROM, was relatively unheard of. Again, it would seem that Kildall was at least a decade ahead of his time. Gary also started another company, which he called Prometheus Light and Sound. It developed a modular phone switching system that integrated landline-based technology and mobile telephony. He called it the IntelliPhone. It reduced high online costs and remotely connected with home appliances. It would exchange emails and files with other IntelliPhone nodes. This was a product at the start of the 90s. Gary foresaw the importance of the cellular mobile phone networks coupled with a future that was going to be online. Outside of his commercial interests, Gary often co-hosted a not-for-profit television show called The Computer Chronicles with Stuart Schiffé an entertaining and informative show for the everyday person. Gary would often undertake interviews and reviews in an unbiased manner, even on products that came from IBM and Microsoft, which talked a lot to his character. In 
In 1991, digital research was sold to then big networking company, Novell. Novell were a good match for digital research, as they could potentially go up against Microsoft. They were the market leader in PC networking at the time, and had some great products. Coupling the products such as Concurrent DOS or NPM, and perhaps developments in the GEM desktop environment, were a great match. Despite a measly $10 million offer from Bill Gates a couple of years prior, Novell saw fit to offer $120 million. With Gary now finally removed from all duties in digital research, Gary moved to Texas and participated in volunteer efforts, assisting children with HIV AIDS and invested much time in driving his fast cars and his Learjet. Despite the early retirement at 49, the upset from what Microsoft had done to Gary was constantly in his face. It seemed that at every turn, there was a reminder. For example, the CD-ROM standards that Gary had been pioneering with Sony were arguably stolen by Bill Gates in later development. After sharing some aspects of the upcoming CD-ROM work he was doing, Kildall was invited by Microsoft to talk at a Microsoft-hosted presentation on CD-ROM. And despite each attendee of the presentation having to pay $1,000 a ticket, Kildall was not paid a cent for presenting. Another example was IBM's endorsement of DR-DOS. IBM had fallen out with Microsoft, and their exclusive marriage was at a shambolic end by the end of the 1980s. IBM decided to officially endorse DR-DOS for the new IBM PCs, saying that DR-DOS 6.0 would ship with new PCs. Bill Gates became furious and threatened retaliation should they go through with the endorsement. Examples of such retaliation could be seen in the Windows 3 detection of DR-DOS mentioned earlier. IBM later withdrew their endorsement, backing down in fear of what the market leader could do to her IBM, which were losing the PC market to IBM-compatible PC clones, a far cry from the dominant force that IBM were just a decade earlier. Novell later acquired a company called Caldera, who sued Microsoft for anti-competitive behavior, citing by anti-competitive predatory means, Microsoft had cut DR-DOS sales by 91%. This legal battle went from 1991 to 2000, where Microsoft settled for an undisclosed amount just a few weeks before the case was to go to a jury vote. The final insult to injury was perhaps when, in 1992, the University of Washington celebrated their 25th anniversary of their computer science program, of which Gary was by far their most lustrous alumni. Gary was invited, of course, but was horrified to find out that Bill Gates, who was by now a generous donor to the university, had been invited to be the speaker and guest of honour. This event was perhaps the beginning of the end for Gary. His mental and physical health started to really take a dive from this point onwards. Amongst other illness, Gary developed a heart arrhythmia, which stopped him from his other true love, flying. Gary passed his flying helmet to his friend, Tom Rollander, never to fly again. Gary was so offended by the actions of the University of Washington, along with the Gates version of the Day Gary Went Flying story, that the following year, 1993, he decided to put pen to paper in order to get the record straight, in his eyes, for once and for all. The memoir was to be called Computer Connections, People, Places and Events in the Evolution of the Personal Computer Industry. In the book, he is quoted as saying, The University of Washington Computer Science Department educated me so that I could produce compilers like PLM. Then I made CPM a success through millions of copies sold throughout the world, again using my knowledge gained through education at the University of Washington. Gates takes my work and makes it his own through divisive measures, at best. He made his cash cow MS-DOS from CPM. So Gates, representing wealth and being proud of the fact that he is a Harvard dropout without the requirement for an education, delivers a lecture at the 25th reunion of the computer science class. Well, it seems to me that he did have an education to get there. It happened to be mine, not his. Indeed, these sound like the words of a man who had become bitter. Gary had developed a chronic problem with alcohol and was spending much time in bars. Although Gary had remarried in 1986, his second marriage to wife Karen had not been without troubles, and they also divorced around this time. 
In the summer of 1994, Gary took a vacation back to Monterey. On the 8th of July, around midnight, it was reported that he fell in a bar and suffered a concussion. There are a few versions of this story, including one where Kildall was assaulted as a result of wearing Harley Davidson leathers. Kildall went to hospital following his head injury, but was discharged twice over the weekend, believed to be because he refused medical treatment. However, a day later, Gary was back at the community hospital of the Monterey Peninsula, but this time he sadly was pronounced dead. He was 52. Later, Gary's friend Tom Rollander stated that he died from a heart attack. An autopsy could not conclusively determine the cause of death, so whether there is a connection between a clot caused by his brain hemorrhage and his heart attack, it's simply not clear. Reports in the press stated that the injury that Gary sustained could have been a result of foul play, and later, in July, it was called a possible homicide by California police. Whatever truly happened in Gary's final days appears to be a true mystery, shrouded in confusion. In 2016, the first few chapters of the memoirs Computer Connections were published online by Gary's children. However, they decided to hold the rest of the memoirs back because they didn't feel it represented the values and personality of the man that they knew to be their father. To quote Gary's children, Scott and Kristen Kildall, Gary viewed computers as learning tools rather than profit engines. His career choices reflect a different definition of success, where innovation means sharing ideas, letting passion drive your work and making source code available for others to build upon. His work ethic during the 1970s resembles that of the open source community that we have today. Gary was a man who was inventive, compassionate and loved life. Despite many of the Hall of IT fame appearing at the 300 strong memorial service at the Naval Postgraduate School, Bill Gates was not amongst them. Gary's ashes were buried in the evergreen Washelli Memorial Park in Seattle with a small modest tombstone with an image of an anchor and a floppy disk. This memorial park is not far from Bill Gates' $60 million mansion. Thank you for watching this documentary on Gary Kildall. If you found it interesting, informative or entertaining in any way, I'd appreciate you giving it a thumbs up and subscribing to my channel. If you really like the stuff I do, then why don't you head over to patreon.com forward slash Lab. You'll find early releases of the videos over there, all without ads, as well as extra behind the scenes stuff. You'll get your name in the credits just like these lovely people here. Patreon subscriptions start from just $3. Any money earned from Patreon or ads goes directly back into funding future videos. Thanks also to the many sources consulted in order to make this video possible, with special credit to Harold Evans for his excellent book, They Made America. You can see the sources cited in the description text of this video.